Hey there athletes, Coach John Ferry here from Team Wilpers. Very excited to welcome you to the week four athlete briefing for the Half Marathon Run Challenge. I hope everyone is having an excellent week three. And speaking of week three, we're gonna start off with our typical week three review. So we're starting the week with that endurance run with stride. So we've done this one before. We're likely to do this one again over the course of time. What we're trying to do here is have a nice, easy aerobic training session, we're trying to keep repeating the strider work. We want to be starting to feel real proficient at those. That's going to be something in our runner's bag of tricks that we use for warm-ups, we use for easy workouts to break that stride length up a little bit. But this is something very much that I want you to be getting better week by week. So keep working at that. I'm sure you're doing great. And then finally, we just want to fit, make sure it stays nice and light start to finish. Once again, aerobic training session in this workout, building that base. Key workout number two, 45 minute progression run. So this is a workout where we move from easy pace to marathon pace to half marathon pace before coming back to a short cool down. I have to be honest. So I was talking about this workout last week. I was awfully glad I wasn't doing it myself. 25 minutes of time between marathon pace and half marathon pace early in a training cycle is a tough workout, but from all the posts I've seen from you all thus far, it appears you're nailing it. So I'm glad, great, great, great prep, working in that marathon pace, half marathon pace, sub threshold range. That's gonna be exactly where we wanna start working, feeling really comfortable with. That's what that race pace is gonna be come March and April, it's right around that time. So incredible job nailing that progression run. Everybody's killing it. And finally, our key, Third key workout of this week, our long run, six to eight miles are a range here in week three. So we're moving an upward trend. I know last week we talked about, that we, especially at this point moving forward, wanna be really starting to experiment with nutrition, experiment with hydration. And if that's something you wanna make part of your race plan, don't wait on that. So that should be happening this week. And this is naturally our longest long run of this challenge. So. Next week, which we're about to get into, we'll pull it back down, but this is our longest long run of this challenge. So have fun with it. You should walk away from the end of it still knowing that you had more to give. So don't be afraid to dial that pace range back down. So my weekly reminder, check the box. Go to the website as you're completing these workouts, as you're completing your week, go to the website, make sure to check that box, give yourself credit for doing the workout. 100% completion percentage, it's an amazing goal to have throughout the scope of the 10 weeks of this challenge. It is absolutely the number one thing that will set you up for success come race day, is that consistent training and 100% completion percentage. So go check the box. So now on to the week four workouts. And so here's the deal with the week four workouts. We don't really need to talk about the individual workouts themselves. What well, instead we're gonna talk about is the overall theme of the week at large. So this is a week, certainly a trap week. I'll pick on some people this week a little bit. This is a week where I would say we separate people who are training. We separate, I'm gonna rephrase, separate, we separate athletes who are training from people who are exercising. And so for exercise, you move around a bit, your heart rate goes up, you sweat a little bit, you've exercised. It's great, there's an absolute time and a place for exercise. It's in a boot camp class. However, there are people that are training and when you're training, it means a little bit something different. It means you're doing things physically that in which we want a specific adaptation from your body to help you prepare for a specific task. And so in training, things happen a little bit differently. And so part of that training is a loading process, which is what we've done for three weeks where we load volume, we load intensity, we add pressure onto you, and then there's an unloading process because you can, there's no straight line to success. It takes a step back, and what we're hoping for is more of a, a curve that's in a, working in an upward trajectory. But these unloading parts, processes are part of the training process. So what we do in an unload is we reduce the volume, we re reduce the intensity. What we continue to do is train aerobically. And since the half marathon is a race that's run 99% aerobically, we're not really moving away from the, the scope of, that we need to be working on. As a matter of fact, we're working exactly on the scope of things we need to be working on. But in the process, we're hopefully giving your body a chance to recover from some of the intensity, the added 
uh, impact from more, you know more fast-paced running. We're once again continuing to train aerobically and focus on the energy zone that's most prevalent for the race. And what we're you know probably most importantly is we're trying to set the stage for now more difficult loading cycles to come. We're not just gonna repeat what we just did or even maintain that intensity level. We're about to kick it up a notch. We're about to add, once again, more intensity and more volume on the three weeks to follow this. So it's important to take this pullback, kind of in, use it for what it is, which is a chance to train aer aerobically, a chance to kind of absorb the training load that you've taken thus far, and to get ready for the intensity that's about to follow. So when I have athletes nailing their training, nailing their training week after week, doing incredibly hard workouts, doing them perfectly, they are so excited. They are looking forward and counting the days to these weeks because they know that this is their reward for doing all the hard work during that time. Where I start to struggle with athletes actually is not with the people who are nailing their workouts. It's the people who have pushed back workouts, missed workouts, not as consistent with their workouts, and then I have a hard time getting them to actually like scale down because they feel like they've fallen behind. So if you fall into that camp, it's okay. This is a great week to call like a reset week to kind of go through, make sure to hit all the workouts, hit all the workouts on time. Is not a great time to go back and say, I'm gonna like make up workouts that I missed from a week or two ago, you don't have the momentum. So once again, great time to kind of draw a reset and say like, okay, these are 30 minute workouts, 45 minute workouts, you know, whatever it might be. I'm gonna come back into this and when I approach week five, I'm gonna repeat, uh, approach week five with full focus. So it made me think a little bit. I saw, I was, uh, you know, scanning the, the old interwebs the other day. One of our coaches just ran a 230, I think 232 marathon in Houston. I was talking a little bit about motivation and, uh, and kind of its juxtaposition with discipline which made me think very much about our challenge here and our challenge crew and what that relationship is between motivation and discipline. And motivation is great. Motivation is what gets people started, right? So week one, workout one, everyone here, tremendously motivated. But motivation is fickle and it's quick to disappear. Cold weather, rain, cold, kid woke up early, etc. Motivation, quickly gone. It's where discipline becomes so important. And, what, and I ultimately think what takes people from week one to week 10 of the program and sets up success, it's not the motivation, it's, it's that translation of motivation into discipline. So maybe start thinking about what do I think is the discipline that you know, ultimately spells success for the people in this challenge. And that discipline I would say is making sure to schedule your workouts. It's so one of the biggest pitfalls I see time after time after time is just kind of assuming that they're going to fit into your schedule. It very rarely happens. So schedule the workout, put it into your calendar. Know not only what day you're gonna do it, but what time you're gonna do it. And I will tell you from the scope of years of working with athletes, my athletes that work, get up at five and work out at 5.30 have incredibly high completion percentage. My athletes that say like, I'm gonna squeeze it in on my lunch break, you know, after I drop off this kid and pick up that kid, maybe 50%. Either way, it can work. It has to be in a time where you can be focused, you can be committed, make sure to preserve that time. But that's where I say number one of discipline here is scheduling your workouts. Number two, doing what you said you're gonna do. So we all came in, we said in 10 weeks time, and we chose our, our kind of our mode of transportation, if you will, three, four, or five runs. All you have to do is simply said what you said you're gonna do. You said what you said you're gonna do, follow that commitment to yourself, and it's gonna happen for you, I can guarantee it. See, gotta eliminate the obstacles and the excuses that we make for ourselves. I can't tell you the amount of times that I've had conversations about how to shift a workout around that were longer than the workout itself. If, had I just been able to get off the phone with the person to let them go do the workout, it would have been over by the time we talked about how to reschedule it. So the, we can be our own worst enemy. We can get our, in our own way a lot. You start to remove some of those hurdles by one, put it right on your calendar, and then two, doing what you said you're gonna do, which prevents obstacles and excuses. D, 
We practice smart training tactics. That's what we're coming into this week. This is part of the discipline where I know, I know that you can do more, but smart training says to do less. So we listen to smart training, we take the discipline to do less, and we go into our week knowing that we're gonna keep it nice and easy, and we're gonna come back and we're gonna crush week five. Week four challenge, train smart, have fun. See the theme? So share a photo or story about how you recover. We'll pick our favorite and send a little TW swag your way. So make sure to tag at Team Wilpers, at Team Wilpers Run Challenge, and use the hashtag Team Wilpers Half to participate. That hashtag is very important because it's how I filter this one from the Winter Run Challenge. So make sure to tag Team Wilpers, Team Wilpers Run Challenge, but most importantly, hashtag Team Wilpers Half. As always, the contributions to these photo contests is amazing. It's a pleasure each week to look through, not only really enjoy the creativity you all bring to it, but it's also really awesome just to see how everybody's crushing their workouts. So thanks for continuing to send those in. Some questions that have come up from the group. Terry asks, I've been using Huma gels for distance running. They've always worked well for me, but I'm wondering if it's possible for our bodies to get used to fuel and not benefit from it as much over time. Is it better to stick with the same old thing that seems to be working or is it better to try something new? So great question. We kind of kick-started the nutrition conversation uh, last week. It could something we could talk about for a hundred weeks to follow and never have a, a finite answer either way, but always worth talking about. So first off, Huma for the, uh, and I think I'm pronouncing that right, but it, it might be not. Uh, is a chia-based gel. So its claim to fame is that it is a natural, more real food gel. Uh, I think every, most people kind of know now natural is, there's nothing that kind of, um, you know, quantifies that, but their claim to fame and what they hang their hat on is that they're a little bit more of a real food gel. And I think in essence, I've tried the product in the past, I would say it is. So it would be a great thing to look into for someone that doesn't like the artificial flavor of, let's say, uh, I'll pick on goo, like goo brand gels for me are very kind of uh, sweet, chemically tasting. They work, you know, they work. So, you know, if you can tolerate them and a lot of people love them, um, but the human gel is a little bit more real food. So if you're looking for something that's like tastes a bit more fruit forward, like actual food, like actual fruit, as opposed to like a, a syrup, Huma might be a thing to, to try out. So maybe a con, a possible con, which is only possible, is that there certainly have been new products that have come onto the marketplace that have claimed all sorts of things. And whether they're true or not, very hard to quantify. I certainly can't quantify it. So I'm, uh, I'm kind of in the experimentation phase with everybody else. However, if you have something that is working for you, one, I, I've never heard of your body kind of adapting to it and the fuel becoming less effective. Actually, as a matter of fact, our bodies are incredibly good at sucking nutrients out of almost whatever we put into them. You know, dietary sensitivities aside, it's gonna kind of get what it wants. So it, we're, most of these things are some combination of carbohydrates, right? So as long as you're putting carbohydrates in, your body is gonna pull those things. and. We can certainly get into an argument about a combination of does glucose and fructose as a combo versus fructose only like make a difference and in essence probably in person A but maybe not in B and who knows about person C. The overall point I want to make here about the human gels is that if you have something that works for you, it, I would be very, very reluctant to change it. It's not that I wouldn't experiment. I might experiment a little bit like early in the season, especially if you didn't love maybe the flavor or the texture or were just kind of curious about the, the you know newest, best and brightest thing out there. This would be a great time to experiment. And so you know, moving into the runs we have this week, let's say we're an hour to an hour and a half, something along those natures, or an hour and a half to two hours. You know, however, whatever your nutritional strategy is, I would start to incorporate that new product at the end. That way, if you have any sort of negative side effect, any sort of stomach issues, if this, the, the just doesn't hit your palate right, you're a lot more towards the finish than the beginning. So use the product that you're most comfortable with, 
you know, in the beginning, as you're moving through the workout, and as you start to get towards the la latter phases, you know, last couple miles, is maybe introduce the new product as an experiment, see if you like it. Also, these things are nice, just little nutrition, like kind of nutritional poppers. Um, if you're doing kind of your key workouts in the middle of the week, especially if you're coming in, you've been a couple hours off of food, you can absolutely experiment during your kind of midweek workouts. It doesn't have to be just the long run. So while you don't need the nutritional supplementation, it is something and a good opportunity, especially if you're trying to like find your way into nutrition and fluid intake, you know, use each of those workouts. Otherwise, we don't have that many chances. You know, we're going into week four here. At the end of this week, we're six weeks away from race day, you know, on the way that this challenge is tracking. That's not a lot of opportunities. If you're telling me I have six chances to get this right, if we break it more out over the scope that I have three runs a week for the next you know, six weeks and I've got 18 chances to break it out, I, I like my chances a lot better of finding success. So you know, use each of these opportunities to kind of test. But to loop back, when there's nothing at all wrong with staying with your tried and true. As a matter of fact, in like nine out of 10 instances, I would probably recommend it. So Harris asked, said a vaguely recall discussion about retesting week four and week eight, and is that still on the table? And I can't entirely recall, but I believe what we talked about is kind of the opportunity to retest. And in my opinion, what I said, it, it, you know, so if you didn't like how your week one 20 minute distance test was, or you felt, or, or if you still feel that your paces are too slow or underneath your potential, where I think there's a nice opportunity for a retest is coming off of the unload weeks. And it'll really just be here probably. Um, in week eight, you know, we're kind of too close to the finish line. We're starting to dwindle down after that kind of, you know, second unload. So I would say if you were unhappy with the result of your first distance test, that not here in week four, but coming off of week four, you would replace the top workout of week five with a new 20 minute distance test and see how it goes. So be very clear, don't expect any physical adaptations really to happen in four weeks, They're minimal, very minimal. For physical adaptation, we're looking probably more in at least a six to eight week range to see you know, anything, you know, really substantial. That's sort of ballpark, which doesn't mean you can't improve in four weeks. And especially if you feel like you tested and go well, whether you, you know, were tired, fatigued, didn't execute it the way you wanted, the weather turned out uh, poorly, not a bad idea to maybe retest at the top of week five. I did for a while toy around the idea of having a big group retest, maybe halfway through around week six or so. I've uh, since changed my opinion. I don't think we're gonna do that. We're gonna let the half marathon race at the end be our, our kind of performance test on this one. So maybe another time there. Kevin asks, I signed up for a half marathon to race in another state that has a much higher elevation than my current city. How can I train to account for this? <sighs> Boy, don't you know? Train high, race low. Just kidding, but that is a thing. Uh, ultimately, pros, that's why they all live in, up in the mountains. They train high, come down to Boston, New York City, Chicago, race low. A lot easier that way around, which doesn't mean you can't do it. So first things first, I've actually been like down a rabbit hole of uh, listening to ultra marathon training kind of podcasts and study here recently. And what they talk about, because this happens a lot there, people come from low, low elevation, head to the mountains, and they have to deal with this. And the kind of the advice, the number one advice is come in as fit as humanly possible. The fitter you are, the better you're gonna be able to handle this. So in addition to the normal work you're doing, uh, some focus on VO2 max work is very important. You wanna kind of be raising your ability to handle time at VO2 max because your heart rate is highly elevated uh, or definitely elevated over sea level as kind of one thing to incorporate as an extra into your training. Uh, if you can swing it, and this is pretty challenging to be quite honest, but for racing at elevation, you either want to show up and race immediately, like the day of, or three weeks later. It's so pretty hard, I understand, but sometimes it's possible, depending upon where these races are, there's like kind of a valley and then a mountain, and if you can stay in the valley, 
and drive up to the top and start running, you're actually better off. If you're spending that first night at elevation and then racing the next morning, that's kind of actually the window for like your biggest performance uh, detriment. So if you can, that helps. The final thing I would say is you, you might have to just adjust your pace targets for a race like this. If you're training at a, at a lower level, you're going to elevation, that's maybe sort of something that kind of comes with the, the territory a little bit. It's just focusing on that RPE, focusing on what half marathon pace feels like at a lower level, being especially thoughtful early in the race, making sure that you're kind of trying to maintain that effort level. And then if you feel great in the second half, you certainly can uncork it. Plan on a negative split race there, but I would certainly set that maybe initial target a little bit slower for racing at elevation. Hopefully that helps. Carolyn asks, I am feeling my hip flexors as the volume has increased. Not pain, but they're definitely talking. Hard to know if they're tight or weak. Is it typical or expected for new runners and any suggestions? So one, this is super common. Tight hip flexors in running is, we probably all share the same tight hip, hip flexor uh, scenario, especially more sometimes than others. So the things that create, especially tight hip, hip flexors, not so much in runners, but in adults, sitting at a desk, sitting in a car, sitting on your couch, sitting at a dining room table, see where this is going. It's our extended amount of sit time. And I can't, I'm not saying necessarily this applies to this person because there are people who spend all day standing up, but as a kind of American adult or not only as an adult population, we are kind of conditioned to a lot of sit time. It's this time at work, time in front of a computer screen, time in the car, commuting back and forth. All of that time, what is happening is our hip flexors are actually, you know, kind of in this tight kind of pinched up position. So over the course of a long period of time, what actually happens is that our pelvis it rotates forward. It's called an anterior rotated pelvis. And that puts those hip flexors or kind of tightens them up and keeps them in that kind of squish position. And it also puts your hamstring on permanent stretch. So when think when that pelvis rotates forward, it's taking the hamstring attached in the back, it's pulling it tighter. So then when you go to run, especially on hills, it's gonna exacerbate this a little bit because that hamstring is exposed. But there are some things that you can do for this. So what you wanna do, and what I, I like, and I have a lot, a lot, a lot of athletes do this. This is just kind of a little bit of a pelvic reset before going into their runs, is start with foam rolling the hamstrings. The thing you absolutely do not wanna do is spend much time stretching your hamstrings if this is an issue for you. If you feel like you have these tight hip flexors, if you have chronic like hamstring tightness, it's probably this anterior tilt. So the last thing you wanna do is stretch your hamstrings because you're taking a muscle on stretch. It's trying to stretch a little further, which we don't wanna do. So we're gonna foam roll the hamstrings to make them nice and warm, hopefully get a little blood flow to the area. And then you wanna kind of turn around and open up in a hip flexor stretch. And so my big asterisk always with the hip flexor stretch, you can look up a little video. It's very easy to make the shape very hard to actually hit the muscle itself. So you have to spend some time kind of playing with this one, experimenting with this one to really like get your body and your pelvis tucked to like actually hit the stretch you're going for with this hip flexor stretch. But the two kind of two item routine before your runs, which would be foam rolling the hamstrings, opening up the hip flexor with the hip flexor stretch, I would do it every single time if you're starting to experience some of that hip flexor pain either in or outside of your running. Once again, incredibly common. So experiment with it. This is gonna be good for all of us to do. Well, ladies and gents, that is all here for week four athlete briefing. I hope everyone has an amazing end week three an incredible next week. And I can't wait to see you back here again the week five breathing soon. Have a good one.